And it is indeed very, very exciting, this new idea of Steffi that um, art actually is mixed you know, into the sessions, that there is no longer one session where all the art is bundled. Because at the end of the day, uh, we firmly all believe in this idea that we can only really address the big topics of the 21st century if we go beyond the fear of pooling knowledge and bring all the disciplines together. And of course, that's what Steffi does not only at DLD, but all year long, but so relentlessly introducing people uh, to each other. The art panel um, has a long history. From the very beginning of DLD, I've curated uh, with Steffi this series of, of art talks. And I wanted to just mention one of these art talks from the past tonight and actually dedicate this session to Uber Damisch, the legendary art historian who passed away a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and uh, Uber was on a panel we did actually called Everclouds, where we connected art history, because Uber Damisch wrote the greatest book ever on the cloud in, uh, in art. It's called Theorie de Nuage. At the same time, you know, we had Hans Magnus Enzensberger, very much, of course, connected to what Tanya said before. We always need literature in the mix. Hans Magnus Enzensberger, the great poet, um, uh, wrote, uh, you know, he read his poems about clouds. And then we had lots of, you know, panelists about cloud computing. So this panel is online. It's called Ever Clouds. But today we want to celebrate, actually, and start our art session with the great Walter Prize. We will follow up then tomorrow with conversations with, Jer with Jeremy Shaw about the future of film, with Hito Steyer and her connection as an artist to AI, with Nora Khan, who is going to tell us about artists working with VR and AR, with uh, Maya Hoffman, who is going to talk about her new art center in Arles and the way she addresses digital and analog archives, with Joe Haig, who is going to tell us about the future of printmaking and the digital uh, completely revolutionizing the way how actually prints and editions are made. Francis Kerry is going to tell us about the future of uh, architecture. And last but not least, Anne Imhoff will then revisit the German pavilion of the Venice Biennale last, night, last year for which he won the Golden Lion. Walter actually is also very connected from the beginning, in a way, to uh, DLD, because uh, three years ago, with Steffi and Simon Gaste, we started a series of... Um, programs called 89 Plus. We wanted to find out, actually, what a generation of artists born after 1989 is doing. Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web in 89. So it's the first generation of artists who have grown up, actually, with digital media. And one of the things we discovered, we discovered many patterns, patterns that connect. We looked at 8,000 artists of that generation. We saw, um, among the patterns, a complete new dimension of drawing. Doodling is back. Uh, and Walter, of course, is not only one of the great painters of his generation, but also one of the great doodlers. He's made thousands and thousands of amazing drawings, and we'll have in the background here, during the talk, some of Walter's paintings and some of Walter's drawings. So before I now give him the first question, please give another very warm applause to Walter Price. <laughs> And Walter, I wanted to begin with the very beginning and ask you how it all started, how you came to art, or how art came to you. You were born in 1989 in Macon, Georgia. Yes, I was born in Macon, Georgia in 1989. Um, I guess it all started one day I can remember seeing my oldest brother make a drawing of uh, just a banana in very urban clothing, and I thought that what he created was very cool, and I started drawing ever since. He doesn't draw or create any art anymore, but that one moment is the thing that I remember, and since then I've been drawing and drawing. <laughs> and can you maybe tell us about the first works where you felt you know, it was no longer student work, the, where your work began? Honestly, um, I'm not even sure when the transition happened because I draw so much, and it just is such a fun thing for me to do that uh, once I kind of slowly began to get introduced to painting and watercolor and realized that it was more of a, a mental challenge, the drawings kind of allowed me to approach painting with much more confidence. So, I mean, I would guess, um, I, I guess the, when I made the decision to go to the Navy to go to art school is when I realized that I should, you know, be an artist. 
And you have a very specific ritual, uh, how you actually draw. It's Tarkovsky, the filmmaker, once said, you know, we need rituals for the 21st century. We have a necessity to find new rituals. And your rituals is very, very specific. You, you get up even earlier than me. You get up at 4, 4 a.m., 4.30 a.m. Um, and as far as I understand, you, you exercise. And the exercise is a direct preparation for your drawing because you started to make these ambidextrous drawings. Can you tell us about that whole morning ritual? Yes. Um, I've always been an early bird, and um, I'm from the South. So um, I just re remember several mornings waking up with my mom sitting on the front porch watching the sunrise and just having conversations about life and, you know, what we had to do that day. And um, I kind of just took that into further preparation as a, you know, so I wake up around 4.30, 4.40 in the morning. Um, I do very rigorous stretching, which took me a while to get comfortable with because I felt like I was the stiffest guy in the world. So um, once I realized that it's so helpful to stretch and, you know, exercise, I decided to, I'm a big fan of basketball, like huge fan, and I've always been a fan. But since I was so dedicated to art, I didn't feel like I had time to even practice or play because art came first. So recently um, I decided to commit more to trying to play basketball and be skilled at it since I was a fan of it. And I also realized that, I wanted to be able to paint with both my left, my right and my left hand because, you know, why not? I don't want to feel like, you know, if I hurt my right hand, I can't paint, you know, with my left hand. So I felt like basketball would be the fastest way to become ambidextrous or just be more comfortable with my left hand because it's a, such a fast sport and it's so competitive. So I wake up every morning, I practice working on my left hand layups and basketball skills. I do my stretches and then I usually immediately go to the studio right after feeling fairly exhausted. But I think it just really helps me to just push my practice to the next level. And the studio visit um, I made, I mean, I visit studios every day, but of all the studio visits I've made last year has been uh, one of the really most extraordinary experiences because not only did we see in your laboratory, you know, all these new paintings and portraits and landscapes and, and so on. But we saw literally thousands of drawings. And before we talk about the paintings, maybe one more question about the drawings. I just want to ask you to tell us a little bit about this experimentation, because you draw in notebooks, uh, and it seems to be an endless flow, like a stream of consciousness, no? Yes, I feel like um, drawing is such a, so much freedom, and with painting, it has to be a little bit more... Uh, cohesive and together to, you know, communicate to the audience, you know, and not look like you're all over the place. So with drawing, it's just total fun and experimentation. And I just imagine the joy I get out of watching my nieces and nephews when they draw, you know, or, you know, your kids when you tell them to draw mommy and daddy and they do it with such confidence, even though they're holding the, the crayon with like two hands, but it's just so enthusiastic. So I just feel like with using drawing mediums and just not having any limits, it just allows, you know, some beautiful pictures, some ugly pictures, you know, but at the end of the day, it's just, you know, expressive. And I think that's very important, you know, because I can may not, I may not like one thing, but, you know, to the, it's not just about me. So it's really communicating to a mass audience. So, you know, we all have different ways of seeing. So I think that's important to not put myself in such a, you know, square. And of course, the future, as says Panofsky, the art historian, is often invented with, you know, fragments from the past. And we all, you know, in that sense, stand on the shoulders of giants who lived before us. So I was kind of wondering who are the artists, painters or artists from the past who, who inspire you? Um, so I, I, I decided early on that I wanted to be an artist. Um, and I just remember seeing a, an image of Jacob Lawrence online in a Navy uniform. And I was going to the Navy at the time, so I just realized that, you know, if he took this path, I could take this path to be an artist. So he was one of my biggest influences. And what about uh, literature? Because it's interesting, you know, we're here in the literature house, and of course, um, uh, you read a lot. So I was kind of wondering, uh, what is the kind of bridge you have between your painting and, and reading? I try to read 
a lot of different things at once and I always like try to I realize lately that I try to keep a highlighter to really like you know mark certain notes to remember because just like how we are I feel like we're all losing our attention span is getting smaller because of so much information I feel like that's what can happen with you know reading so many books or trying to get so much information at one time so yeah, I've seen, lately I've been reading um, this book, uh, Emotional Intelligence. And, uh, it's written by uh, Gene Bradbury and a couple, a few more um, authors. But uh, I just started the book, and it just, it's just very, it's a very, the, the beginning of the book is a very good story about how this surfer survived nearly being attacked by a shark, and he used his emotional intelligence by not being like by basically being in control of his fear and kind of figuring out how to avoid the shark and he was just talking about the process of going through fear, anger, realizing he was about to lose his life. And I just think stories like that just motivate me in a way to just let us know that, or just communicate to me that it's, it's all, it's, in a way it just makes you feel like you, you are just more, much more powerful if you can be in control of your emotions and in control of your actions and try to you know, dictate things based on those. And then, of course, there are your paintings, and there is a kind of an incredible concentration there. You translate your experience into lines and colors. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because some of them are like landscapes. There's often a sort of a displaced or fragmented horizon line. Uh, there are kind of also interiors. Yes. Uh, one thinks sometimes it's a domestic scene, but then there are missing walls, and it's kind of, again, you know, opening up. And then, at the same time, you also have a new series of portraits in your studio. So. So ask you to tell us about these different paintings. Yes, um, I realized that you know from my drawing obsessively and trying to finish sketchbooks in one day, it leads to me not having to refer to the sketchbooks to make a painting or to approach a painting with uh, the same spontaneity. So, so yes. Um, yeah, the yeah the paintings are just. It's just, I don't know, it's just, man, you know, you just, when you really love to do something, you just get in this zone where you just, you kind of just, you, it's, it's just you and, you know, what you're approaching. So, you know, I, I tend to resort to the line and the horizon line because they were, it reminds me of all those long nights in the Navy when I would, you know, I, I don't smoke cigarettes, but all the other workers did. So, you know, they, they would get to go on cigarette breaks several times and, my way of getting, I guess, my peace of mind, you know, um, out while out to sea, I would just go out and just look out, and you always would see that horizon line, no matter how much the sea, you know, was, if it was a, you know, rough sea or calm sea, it was just this beautiful horizon line. And I always trying to tend to think about that when I create paintings, and, you know, and color is just, you know, um, I think I remember seeing an interview of Stanley Whitney, um, and he said, like, Color is like the perfect subject matter because it's, it's, it's pretty much infinite. And, you know, I took that as a challenge as, you know, color is very difficult, but at, at the same time, it communicates so much more than I can with just my hand, you know. So color is so important. And then just laying, it, laying the colors down in this, these ways and adding all these formal elements, I just tend to try to take all the, the, the basic fundamental elements of art and create a very funky painting, and that's usually my motivation. And do you have a favorite color? My personal favorite color is blue, but I don't think that's really important. I think my favorite color should be purple because it's my mom's favorite color, and she passed away, and she was the most motivating, encouraging person in my life, and that's the only reason I went to the military because I didn't even know how to swim, so, <laughs> you know, I wasn't doing it for me. <laughs> And maybe the future, you're going to have this Robert Rauschenberg residency, and that's, of course, fascinating because Rauschenberg is such a relevant artist for DLD because he brought together technology, art, science, literature. Uh, he's probably the artist in the second half of the 20th century. He was most interdisciplinary, and uh, it's now a foundation. Uh, Kathy Halbreich was just announced to be the new director of this foundation, and you're going to have a residency there. Can you tell us about that? And what um, yeah, uh, usually when I, I mean, I'm just honored to be experiencing all these things and to be accepted into the residency. And I'm just really thankful for, again, for Stanley Whitney for being a part of the reason why I, you know, was accepted to this residency. 
Um, I usually, before experiencing something like this, because the residency starts uh, in August, I try not to think too much about it. But uh, I mean, I'm just honored. To, you know, I, I just know that being back in the South and the warm weather, I can literally push my practice beyond limits because I'll be hot and sweaty and stretching and doing exercises and painting, you know? <laughs> but this is a wonderful uh, conclusion. And we felt, you know, when Steffi uh, rang me for the first time, like last year, and said the topic we is reconquering, um, we felt we're, of course, going to talk a lot tomorrow about, you know, AR and uh, AI and VR and how R connects to all of that. But when Steffi talked about the reconquering, um, I felt very urgently that we began, actually, with this idea of, you know, bringing doodling back, bringing drawing back. Uh, whenever I, I visit architecture offices and art schools right now, I'm told, you know, that basically um, there's less and less doodling going on. And it's kind of fascinating that Walter's generation brings it back. So the future of doodling. Thank you so much, Walter. Thank you all. Thank you all.